Today is March 7th, the third Sunday in Lent. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? He answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I I know I've said this a couple other times in other sermons, but I think we live in a a time period where this bears repeating. Um, The Gospel of John is not encouraging us, despite how some have read it, uh, it is not encouraging us to be anti-Semitic. Uh, Whenever it talks about the Jews, or perhaps it should be better translated the Judeans, it's not trying to say that they're the the opponent. I think Christianity is is best understood in spite the fact of how it has gotten it wrong before. Uh, It it should not be seen as a replacement of the Jewish people. They are still the people of God. I think Paul's theology on this is very clear in his letter to the Romans, and that seems to have at times been forgotten by the church, and it's time to reclaim that. Uh, The Jewish people are are not the enemy in the Gospels or or any of the New Testament. Rather, I think the New Testament is best understood, uh, as some of my uh, colleagues uh, who are Jewish have put it, and that is that the New Testament is an ongoing first century debate about the future of post-temple rabbinic Judaism. And it just so happens that in the Christian view, uh, there is a strong belief that because of Jesus, there is this kind of unique style of inclusion of the Gentiles. Paul talks about this in Romans. Uh, It's talked about in the book of Acts a little bit uh, that that this brings us in, that we're being grafted in. We're part of the story. We're not a replacement. So that's, uh, I think, important uh, for us to understand then what's going on in this story where Jesus goes into the temple and uh, uh, seems to be saying, you've been doing it wrong. And and, yeah, I I think he is arguing that. That, that there's something not right about what's happening in the temple. And it's, it's not that what's there, is, there's, there's no indication of any kind of thievery or, or that, that, that this, this money changing is wrong um, in, 
and a sense of kind of how people are being treated. Uh, at least none that, that I can find. And I know that I think there's some speculation out there that it may have been. Uh, but really, from what I can tell, it's just the standard practice of allowing people the opportunity to uh, change their currency from the Roman imperial currency with all the images stamped on it uh, to a currency that's appropriate for paying their tithe to the temple. Uh, that is one that doesn't break one of the commandments with having a, an image on it. Uh, that's how I understand what's going on. So then there's this kind of question about why is, why is Jesus so upset that he makes a kind of whip that he uses to drive uh, the, the animals out of the temple, uh, and by extension, at least, uh, the, the money changers. What, what's going on with that? I think it's also important to understand in the context of the Gospel of John that, uh, that this happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, where every other Gospel puts it at the end of Jesus' ministry. Uh, that is like, like almost like Jesus in the other Gospels is going to prepare uh, the temple, uh, at least as an image, for the sacrifice that he is about to offer. Uh, whereas John seems to use this as an image of what Jesus' ministry is going to do transformatively for the people of God, uh, in, including the Jewish people. That, uh, that At least that placement. It's also interesting that this is the story that is then used to lead into the, um, the story about Zacchaeus coming at night to visit Jesus. Um, or, sorry, uh, Nicodemus uh, coming to visit Jesus at night. And, and Nicodemus is another example of kind of this, um, that, that, that the Jewish people are not the, the opponents. Yes, Nicodemus comes to Jesus confused at the very beginning. About halfway through the Gospel of John, Nicodemus is like, I don't, I don't quite have this Jesus guy figured out. And then by the end, it's very clear that, that Nicodemus is a... Um, disciple of Jesus. He shows up with an inordinate amount of, of burial spices to prepare Jesus' tomb with. And he's there with Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who is also a known, at least to the narrative, uh, a, a known disciple of Jesus. So that, that's the, the question is not the people, but the style. And, and that's kind of what I think is going on in this text. It's important for us to remember that near the end of the, the reading that we have today, it's very clear Jesus is talking about his body. There's another point where this comes up, my, my father's house. And that, that seems to be the thing, is that, that the temple has gone from being a house where it is seen that God dwells among God's people to a kind of uh, functionary space where we just worship, right? And and there's this whole process that you go through, and and it's something you do rather than a state of understanding our relationship with God. And that seems to be more than anything else what Jesus is critiquing here, and it comes up again. Uh, later in the text that's very popular for sermons, uh, for funerals, uh, it's, it's the standard go-to sermon, or, or at least text that I read at, at funerals, if not do a sermon on. And, and that is where uh, Jesus says, um, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, in my father's house, there are many mansions or dwelling places, depending on the, the translation that you're familiar with. Uh, that, that's the other place where this Father's house gets mentioned. And it's connected again uh, to, to Jesus, that Jesus is going uh, to prepare this place. And it's talking about uh, that, that he's, he's going uh, to the cross and, and then to the resurrection. Uh, that this is the way that he's pr preparing this place within his Father's house. So since this is the first time that that language of my father's house comes up, 
and it, it's directly connected to his body, I think really the claim is, uh, again, it's, it's not about the processes. It's not about the building. It's about a relationship with God and Jesus making a claim that there is a unique relationship that is established through him uh, to his father. Uh, that, that John has already started uh, the gospel, his gospel account, with telling us that Jesus is God incarnate. Uh, and so now as the son of God, dwelling on earth, this is a new temple creating a new relationship. Okay, so that's a lot of background, and, and I apologize for that. Uh, and so now I have to ask the question of myself and of this text for us right now. So what? And I can't help but think about the fact that uh, I'm looking through these windows at a church building that we cannot gather in. And that uh, at this time, that we're kind of being invited to rethink uh, about what it means to be the people of God outside of kind of the processes of gathering in that building of the things that we would typically do on a Sunday morning. And to rethink those in the context of being the body of Christ that is dispersed uh, out into uh, our, our homes and online and not gathered together. And I, I don't think that that means that we need to forget about the building. But I think it, in, in our context during this time of Lent and during this time of pandemic that this text might be inviting us to continue to always rethink the role of of the the building and our processes of worship and how they might play into the future that God is calling us to after this time is done and and I think it's inviting us to remember to stay focused on the fact that it is a dwelling. It is God dwelling among us that is the most important thing. And that the building and our worship services and our gatherings all serve to remind us that God is with us and that God is for us and that God continues to dwell with us and sometimes it might be God dwelling with us in our pain and our suffering. Sometimes it's God dwelling with us in our joys. And, and I think it's always important to remember that whether it is in good times or bad, that God is present to transform and change towards what is most life-giving for us and for those who are around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. There is no other God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your foolishness, O Lord, is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Transform the work of legislatures, judicial systems, and the systems of law enforcement so that they may protect the well-being and freedom of all. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this community and our leaders so that we may follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear now, O Lord, those prayers of concern and of thanksgiving, which we now lift before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for Perpetua and Felicity and all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else that you see that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us in God's grace, now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.